Wow. Great. So Jack and Doug, could you please introduce yourselves? We'd love for you to frame it however you would like. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, and you're on mute. Doug just reminded me of that. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Jack Kelly. I'm a Scrum Master. We're from Minnesota. And, and Doug and I have been doing uh, Scrummy Scrum stuff for a handful of years. My whole like work life has been in big corporations. So, you know, I grew up in, you know, all sorts of levels of bosses and management and red tape and this and that. And um, I learned agile stuff at, when I was a QA person on a team. Um, you know, so I was a team member and it was cool and I loved it. And I did that for a handful of years. And that's how I met Doug. We were at the same company together. And, um, and he left. <laughs> he can tell you all that stuff. But then I was like, hey, I want to be a scrum master. So I became a scrum master. I got opportunities. I was in the right place at the right time. And, um, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of here right now. I'll let Doug kind of finish off for us. Yeah, Jack did a good job. So I'm Doug Darno. I am now a leader in the Agile space. I, I lead a team that is, is kind of focused around this. So with, with kind of the evolution of it to Jack's point, like being in different roles, like both of us came from, you know, I came from the BA background, some of the traditional project management stuff before making some of those leaps. So one of the things that, that we found, right, which is, you know, we were always getting in situations where we go to a company and, and we'd have new coaches in and, and you see so many variances on, on how things were implemented. So for us, it was really about like, how do you actually create a better way that's going to be sustainable? Because I think we got in a couple of situations where, you know, it was implemented and then never talked about again and some really bad habits were there. So that's kind of where our passion was. We, we even wanted to podcast about it because we were so passionate. So that's one of the things that I think we'll continue to, you know, kind of keep pushing on and, and kind of bring the voice of reason, hopefully in the space at times. It's not always easy is the, is the simple answer from us. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so our presentation then is gonna be, we're in a really good place right now. Um, you know, Doug is at the table, for, well, more to come on this, but we want to share kind of like, how did we get in this really good place in this big corporation? where you have all sorts of management and red tape. Um, you know, how are we in a spot where we can do like some self-organizations and um, do some of the cool agile things without ruffling feathers? So how do you just shift where you're at today? That's, that's the biggest piece of it. So you got to understand it. So part of what we want to talk about and, and what we had hope is if you want to stop us and ask questions or you have scenarios or things that you are curious about as we're going through this, like don't hesitate to maybe raise your hand or interrupt us. Like, we'll try to answer your question. So, yeah. Um, as I'm, I'm micromanaging Jack over here. Oh, where'd my mouse go? No. You uh, see the mouse anywhere? Oh, it's over there. Yes, there you go. You guys uh, have a mouse problem over there? Do you need a cat? No, 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 all right. Uh, was that being recorded? Yes. All right, just edit that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as, like I said, if you want to interrupt us, we're, we're not going to see the screen when we're going through this. So either just yeah. let, we got our camera off so we can look at this stuff. So if you guys want really like questions, like shout it out or give a little wave to uh, Catherine or Sherry and then they can interrupt us. So interrupt us, go for it. Right. So this is our first slide from system to value <laughs> from the semi hits from under siege. We thought it was a little shot at us. We loved it though. All right, let's go. So this, the nice thing about this, we even threw a picture in. So we did the introductions already. This is actually from Jack's garage where we tried to podcast one day. And it actually worked. I think that was kind of a good little podcast. Except you have like, there is a school behind him. <laughs> yeah. So right. the kids were in recess. So you could just hear like all the kids in the background. So that, that added some white noise. Um, That's our mic right down there. Back. See that little mic between us? That, that was our podcasting microphone. That was our equipment. So, A, if you guys, if anybody out there wants to podcast, you want to talk to us about it, we'll, we'll talk to you about it, right? Just get a laptop and a mic and you're cool. All right, let's go on. So one of the things that we want to focus on today is, is break it down into three pieces. One, you know, how do you identify the here and now? Like, where are you at today? Some of you are in different positions inside the company, different journeys along the way, different maturity. That's just kind of 
at a, you know, at a high level, that's what we're looking at. So just kind of understanding where you're at and, and diagnosing that too. How do you get to that high level setup? How do you start to think about change? And sometimes you won't get there for until much later, right? Some catalyst mm -hmm. will change that, but I think that's kind of part of it. So like what are techniques or things that you can actually talk about to think of a different way of working? And then three, ideally, once you've arrived, that doesn't mean your work's over. So as you think about things like scale or you think about setting up a new way of working, which I know you're gonna talk quite a bit about, but how much effort still goes into that and probably, you know, ideally it would probably never end just because you, you learn so many new things. So that's at a high level what we're focused on. All right. So this is like a three dog walk. So let's start our first yes. dog walk. Three <laughs> seconds. Like, where are you at? So I think the biggest thing is where are you at today? So you look at it, do you have, teams created around specific systems? Is that just kind of how the company has been built? I think you'll see that in a, a lot of long tenure standing companies, you think of the airlines and stuff like that. Um, do projects just kind of show up and assign to you? I think that's the other piece of it. Do you have any control over what you prioritize? Are you constantly relying on other teams? I think that's also a symptom of a team that's been around for a while and sometimes can be just part of startups too, but Anyone, you know, this could be interactive. Is anyone feeling this pain? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No surprise. I think it's, I think it's pretty common, right? Especially for like, you know, a, a big corporation, they hear, hey, it's agile. Yeah, we want to do agile, right? We can get stuff out faster and blah, 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 and all that other stuff. You know, but, you know, when they realize how much change is involved, well, they'll want to do agile, but they'll want to do it on their terms. And that's, let's keep our systems teams together. Let's just push work to the teams, you know. Um, yeah. Country project cost. On time and on budget. Yeah. <laughs> so I think one of the things that we just wanted to share with you, we've been here and I think we've been there several times with different companies. So you really, you know, when I, when I talk about this, I, I really do mean this, like, you got to think about why the company created the systems that they do today. Like, what are the bright spots? So like some companies were really good at, you know, I'm just thinking of an example of t like companies we've been at, small projects, like they were really good at anything that was two months or less. You gave them that and they consistently got the features and the customer feedback. But then once they got to bigger stuff, they just kind of ignored everything they did. Um, even though they kind of adopted some better ways of working. And that's just kind of part of like people not thinking about the customer, looking at the value or, or doing some of that research. So there's things like that that you can look at. Um, you know, I think the other part of it is, you know, system applications that are, are consistently focusing on a feature were there for a reason. I think sometimes we forget that because these companies scale and things be, I think they just get lost. It just becomes this big, black hole of stuff that people really start to add on to or I call you know it's kind of that that initial purpose is lost because you lose those people that created that stuff and then nobody really has to answer for it anymore so you know what was the real real reason for that stuff um I think the other thing that you always get and this is the number one thing that I think I've seen I'm looking at Jack here but you get a lot of situations where if you do have tenure, now it's different if you're in a startup that kind of stuff or high turnover, um, but you get silos because people feel comfortable with having the answer. Like it's very easy to get used to an environment and it's not bad because they've operated that way for a certain point in time, now it's changing it, but you look at it, you have the answer to a sales problem or to a check-in rules engine or something, you know, within a minute people get used to it. So they're not going to push that person to something else. They're going to say, you're really good at this. So let's keep you here. So it's kind of that comfort level. So it's kind of the question of in order for you to change this stuff, you have to understand, you know, why you got here in the first place. Cause that's, that's the first point of change management really that you'll get to because people that don't think you recognize them, I think the problem or you recognize why they were good in the first place will kind of ignore you. I think it goes both ways too. So like, if you're trying to change that model or whatever you want to call it, right? And, you know, you have, you know, the people on top are like, seems to be working for us. We're cool with this. We don't need to do too much. But then you also have like, I think there's a certain percentage of the people that are on the ground that are doing the work in those systems. Like, they're comfortable too. I'm an expert in this thing. 
you want me to learn something new? <laughs> I don't, you know, some people are cool with that. Like, yeah, bring it on. I'm, I like change. I like to learn, but there's other people that are, you know, well, have pushed back you know, and said, why do you want me to learn that? I'm, I'm happy with this. So, you know, we, we see that sometimes too. You know, I don't know if you guys have seen anything like that, but it's not always a big revolution from the ground. There's pushback from the ground too. That's what we've seen anyways. So I guess the, the piece that, that always comes about, right? Why, why do you do Agile or why do you do the things that you do or why do you try to put scale in? I think it really comes back to, you know, you're no longer able to keep up with the list of work. And I don't think that's because the company isn't nimble, but there's a lot of factors that usually play into this. You know, sometimes it's the tech debt right behind, behind the scenes of, you know, shiny feature after shiny feature that no longer is sustainable. Sometimes it's just a, in an area of the business that no one expected to take off and you're not staffed to deal with. I think there's all sorts of things that you have to look at it, but that usually is a, you know, a driving force for somebody to say, well, I need to look at something different. And, and that might be your opportunity. Sometimes it happens organically where you can make that. And then sometimes it takes not being able to like deliver or starting to miss targets and that kind of stuff from a business standpoint where you start to see people get brought in for this kind of stuff. But I think that's, that's one, you're kind of looking for something like this that will, will drive the change too. I think, you know, feeling like work is just sitting around. So I think a lot of companies will look at this too, you know, if you're in the situation and I think people have talked about it, you probably heard about it where you see stories or work or, list of items that people are saying hey what's the hang up here like it shouldn't take this long or i think the common one is you know what what changed it looked good at the beginning when you talked about it it all worked out right yep. yeah and it just feels like it just goes on and on and on so you'll probably hear a lot of active whether it's individual stakeholders customers saying this just isn't working for us like it's taking way too long um Kind of like, I think if you were to look out into the, you know, if you're buying stuff for your house and things like that, and you can't get things like garage doors or interior doors, they're swapping them out. You're like, what's your deal, right? Like you can't just be COVID. So there's, there's things like that as an example that I, I think would be kind of a real life way of looking at it. Um, I think the, the third one really, when it comes down to it, and this is, this happens, but like, I think the teams as a whole, don't make the connection with the work that that you're doing anymore and then it's not only the teams anymore but it's it's the leadership in that area it's you start to look at these these portfolios or business units that lose track of it and it's one person so that i think leads to some sort of what i call businesses taking a lot of attempts at 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 work to change the way that the narrative is done you know think about your your earning calls like a missed project or mixed missed idea or what you name it and it just doesn't seem to be a track record of winning anymore in terms of well, just think about it, your town halls and that would be a catalyst probably for you to say okay like what did we miss here that we no longer understand why we're doing the things that we do in the first place so that's kind of a the three that we said are, there's others but the three that we think are usually a catalyst or what we've seen as a catalyst for us to make bigger changes. Thoughts on that or let's go on to the next slide. Huh? So who's tried to change this? Everybody, or I'm hoping everybody, right? It's hard. I think the better question, right, is, is how do you get there? So if you do see these things, right, it's hard to change companies or people's mindsets when you are having a lot of success when they don't see there's a problem I think that's that's how you probably saw waterfall be you know probably the preferred methodology for as long as it has been because of you know the comfort level things aren't going well and usually the companies that have had to respond are companies that have had a crisis or earnings are down or or some sort of moment where they say things need to change or we're probably going to be questionable long-term on, on survivability of our company. So there's, there's things there that I think, you know, you just have to play into it is definitely harder to push a, a boulder up a mountain, but given, you know, you are in those situations or in and vice versa, there, there are techniques to at least 
work through and do proposals and, and kind of, you know, do small things to get those big victories later on. So I think one of the things that when you look at your scenarios and maybe you can come along this journey as you think about your own experiences, but you think about the number one thing for you to change something is creating your own hypothesis. So what are you looking at first? So if you're in the digital space, there's a lot of things in the digital space that are probably easy to start thinking about in terms of, you know, we're going to grow or our team's going to get very focused on, on the customer or, you know, very service-based. So what we mean by that, we mean that you're creating, app, you know, APIs essentially that would be sold off or a product looking for data or, or whatnot, whether it's, it's something very not as tangible, but yet has high value. So like, how does that change? What kind of data do you need? What are things that you see as opportunities? Like what, what do you know or what do you think could change here? Um, three is kind of the application piece. So if you're in, um, whether it's normal applications, which are, or can be a little bit service in nature for companies or, or the software type, the stuff that you're used to seeing, each thing you can think about, why do people want to use this product? What do you know? Some people think performance. Right? That's the number one thing you always say here is like fast and easy to use. So those are things though that aren't really easy to break down and say, okay, I have much of a hypothesis on here, but like some cases, let's just say, um, take my example before, like you had an application was really good at something and started adding to it. So number one thing that we saw, which wasn't mm -hmm. what the users wanted or the customer. So, and then you could say, if we're not simple, we don't give them a simple experience it's too complicated that's actually hurting us so in this case like the hypothesis would be we need to start scaling our features back or we need to start pulling usage logs or we need to start getting the data if we don't have it already to start building the case on on what the structure is what would be like examples of some of these dogs like service-based like in my brain that comes to like like a, like a bank website or something like that right you log in and deposit or do some transactions you're not buying stuff but you're using it i worked for a tax company that built a virtual tax you know and uh, talk about waterfall the irs isn't exactly agile and their dates aren't flexible you can't do a return every two weeks but they launched a virtual tax platform and they had tons of people click on the first link and almost no one come out at the end and they didn't have the metrics or monitoring to figure out where they dropped off or what percentage dropped off at each step along the way, which is an entire tax return. So it's very lengthy. So we were just flying blind in the middle of tax season trying to figure out why no one used it. Mm. Oh my God, yeah, that sounds, that sounds so hard. There's so many it, was not, it, it was not an agile development process mm -hmm. uh, from a program level. And no. they paid the price that, that tax season. So as you think of that, if you think about that example, like what do you wish they would have done differently? Oh, I mean, they should have just had metrics at each step, right? They should have had monitoring built in as part of, you know, right? We can talk artifacts or whatever, but monitoring should have been considered a critical portion of each feature because you go to launch in tax season. If you don't have an answer each day during that first opening week is millions of dollars and then the end week. So you have these peak periods where you're going to get the best data and an hour could cost you 10,000 returns. You know, during that, right, everyone gets their W-2s and there's that rush. There's two or three rushes in tax season. So it's not three, four months. It's like three weeks where you make 60, 70% of your revenue. So, you know, to not actually understand or be able to track that process was hugely detrimental and wasn't considered part of the, the bill process. Yeah, I think that's kind of speaking to this a little bit. I think it's, it's pretty common, especially you see it in, you know, I think this case, you're looking at something that was built, they thought they had a need. You see a lot of in, in digital, I would say. Um, you almost never see usage logs on, on some of the, you know, behind the scenes servicing apps until it becomes like a crisis. So I think that's the stuff that's that's been interesting, right? Is the, the data points are key to a lot of it. You think of, you know, I'll just give this an example, right? Like I think a lot of the digital products, you think about these websites that are, that have existed, you, you look at banks, a lot of them are expanding these capabilities, but before they're just like, well, you just want to see your account information. And 
we'll do a couple of things here and we'll call it good. And now they're looking at it saying, well, you know, where do you try to go? And you have to look at it and you don't track it or there's not the usability or, or they have, you know, areas where you have multiple sites, for example, multiple products, not uncommon with the mega banks and they don't have any consistent experience. So if you go in, you have a credit card and you have a checking account with some, you, you go to different portals and nobody monitors that. So I think having that sort of data just kind of tells that story where you can go. Now, you don't necessarily need it, but then you are flying a little bit blind when you're making these hypotheses and you better get the data after or some point during this process to kind of start helping with that. Let's keep going. So I think techniques that you could use, and this is this is meant to be more open. You can ask questions, like especially if you don't understand some of these. But I think the stuff that when you look at scaling or, or trying to change the way that you look at it, there's a couple ways, whether it's at a team level or a multi-team, to say, here's some things that I can look at kind of rallying around and structuring. So if you think about techniques like journey maps, um, journey maps really are, are focused on how a consumer or user comes through your, your applications or how you kind of service them and they interact. So it's from their viewpoint. So when you see where they get bottlenecks, you see where that time is, is kind of elapsing more than you would want it to be. I mean, it gives you an opportunity to look at it. it, it you know, things in digital, for example, you're, you're going to look at how somebody enters your website, like one from your marketing tactics, two from getting logged in or signed up for your product and three servicing really at the end of the day. So it comes down to like, what are those steps? How complicated is it? Where are you good today? And so like focusing some energy here to get real user information helps quite a bit to say, how should I think about putting my effort towards there from a team level? Now, if it's one team, it's easy because you focus on the bottlenecks <clears throat> potentially, or that's what the product owner should be looking at. Um, if it's multiple teams, I think it's just more of how do you correctly staff it? So if you have a lot of marketing and marketing is your thing as a company and you're, it's a lot of campaigns and other pieces of it to get that customer outreach, you might have three or four teams focused in that area along the way, but it just kind of depends, right? So I think having that information from there with the, the data, if you have any, can be useful in terms of thinking about staffing or changing your team from a backlog items to something different. The second one I would say, it's kind of an old and tried trick, but it's a uh, current, current versus future state mapping. So as you think about like, where are you at today? Where do you want to go? Um, some people may think this is very similar to the value stream mapping in cases because you're looking at effectively what are the steps to service the customer essentially with a little bit larger scale. Um, but this is really intended to say, you know, what are your opportunities to focus on? So if you're thinking about backlog items or new capabilities that aren't there or things that need to be built out, this is a technique that the teams can kind of get their head around and then start to change in migrations. Another good example of this, that kind of stuff. But sure. you could also do this at a, at a larger scale. It just kind of depends on, on what you're looking at, especially if you got a big service-based offering, especially of well, APIs with a bunch of data points that you wanted to start thinking about on, on chasing a, a potential product, you might do this um, besides some other stuff. Value stream mapping, same kind of concept. You're just kind of looking for, I like to say that these two, depending on what you have, especially with journey maps, probably pair the most well together in terms of saying, you know, what are your internal processes to essentially effectively meet those demands that are coming? What are the applications? As you look at all this stuff, um, they can be useful, but in terms of making a decision with it, they're not very useful without seeing some type of data or some type of hypothesis to look at to say, what was I trying to solve? How does this fit into it? What are issues that I need to actually address? And then I think the thing that, you know, I would say, regardless of what you do, you have to talk to people. Like the ones that know how the business operates or the technology operates, because if you don't, you kind of miss the, you know, I would say the hidden gems of, of your learning process here, which is most people see this day in and day out, but aren't hurt. Or you think about the things that you try to change, like may have not had permission to change, but have seen it. So they just kind of live with it. So that's, 
that's at least at a high level types of tools that, that I would recommend using. We did value stream map, right? Where we're at. Why did, that, why did we do that instead of like a journey? We did both. Did we? Yeah, we, that's right. That's right. Uh, it just it just kind of varies. So like if you're looking at the journey map of it, you're gonna probably most likely be in a digital area or digital interactions that you want to see. Um, now, if you're not in that, you're not gonna necessarily do it. You might look at some different techniques. So like if you're looking at a heavy, heavy service link, right? For example, and you don't have any digital, it's all about the customer really doesn't think of you as a as someone they're interacting with, but you're behind the scenes, behind somebody else, then value stream is a good way to look at it and say, okay, how do how do we organize? How do we meet these types of events as they come up? So that's just part of it, right? Like logic on, on what you might try. And you might try multiple, right? Which is, all right, let's see what we get and then go from there. I'm curious if, uh, if people are familiar with some of these tools or if, if it's new to them or if they have other things that they may have used outside of this. I'm familiar if that helps provide feedback. Where could people find some good information, a good resource to learn more about some of these tools? I think if you if you look online um, at, at a couple of YouTube videos or, or look at you know some of the scrum.org or even I think the stuff that would resonate the best is if you look at some of the information or case studies of some larger companies like a Barclays. For example, who are happy to talk about fusing the two of like when they, they call it, you know, the customer experience essentially, which is their journey map and the value stream steps together. Like they'll actually walk through cases that they had. I think USAA had a couple too. Um, if you look for that and you look up, you know, specifically value stream in those cases, like they have published and, and, and been more vocal about it, but it just gives you a different way to think about it. Um, I think one of the things that you can look at if you want to look at value stream mapping, look at some of like the lean practices of the past, which is kind of you know the what safe has built itself on with some of the value stream activities. So if you look at some of that information as well, um, if you're more a video learner, which I like videos personally, so I would look that direction and just have a couple of people walk through, look for like basic examples, whether you're into banking or into home projects and that kind of stuff. Those are the specific ones that I would say whatever resonates for you will help you learn that. And I did the IBM uh, design thinking certificate. Like it's a really quick one. I think it's like an hour or two. And it really walks through like, why would you do this? And how can you think about solving problems for the user in some of the tools? So there's some really, really great resources out there. And this was one of our first steps to getting away from that system thinking, yeah. that application thinking, having people look at things from a different perspective to, to break some of those dependencies. Well, and I think the big thing, right, is try something is, is probably the, the end result here. Whether you go to a different course or whether you get a certificate, someone talks about you know, I think the big thing really before Agile is people are talking about Lean, right? There's there's some good stuff from Lean that that we forgot about, you know, or we never experienced and some good, some bad. And so if you, you think about you whether know, it's design thinking or you think about, especially when CX starts to become even bigger than it is now, when you think about patterns and reusability and scaling concepts and user data and what to do for user research, which I think will be more complicated than it is now, is take something and just throw it up there. That is, that seems kind of lame, but that's probably the, the reason that most people get bogged down is they put too many things at once and then don't kind of look at, can I do something with what I know? So kind of like what I said, I think I know, but now what? <laughs> But it, it is, it really is, it's like put it on paper. Think about the, whether it's story mapping or journey mapping, putting the sticky notes, just think about putting the sticky notes up there and think of the heart of, of a lot of the conversations that we've had, which is collaboration, talk through problems, get people to get different ideas, start to shop the idea around, see if you're crazy, right? Like 
you're not crazy, then then you get to to make those edits. But I think that's the big piece of it. It's all around collaboration and understanding. So if you can get to a point where you say, okay, what does success look like here? When I think I have something, I think the hypothesis has come true. And I think I have a way to, you know, do what I think. Well, then how do we measure it? And if you don't have the, you know, measures up front, then this is the time to say, okay, where do I actually put in things like a baseline? What do I start to measure and know that I need to pivot off of? So if we don't see this, this changes the way that we think of the idea or the work or the way that we're, we're formed and we can change it. So the thing that I think people miss here is that it's, it's definitely a draft, just like everything. So if it doesn't work, then just look at it again and repivot or rechange it or maybe drastically overhaul and restart all over. There's, that's part of it, right? Like just think about people in Agile and being Agilists. Like the idea is, you know, if we can fail and, and learn from that and, and try a new experiment, then, then you're half there. So overall, I think the skills that you, you definitely need to look at is what do you need from a technology standpoint? So maybe you don't have the data, so get the data. Um, or you have old systems, like maybe you might need to update systems or may, it might be a microservice infrastructure you're creating. Those are parts of this that will be good information for people to understand that are a part of this. I think people is a good one. So understanding what type of people we have. If you have people that are change agents or very open to change or, you know, in terms of the level of change management that you have to go through, which should they're open for change, you're going to get to go through the processes a little bit faster and they're going to like this idea versus the people that are comfortable that you've talked about, Jack, which <laughs> they won't they won't want change or they will want change, but they want to go step by step. So there's, there's some parts of that to think through. Skills is another big thing because if you don't have the skills, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but there does put a difference of uh, understanding in in terms of it's gonna take longer. So it's that I gotta learn that skill set, then I can start applying it. I'm not really gonna be that efficient, even if I try things like, um, let's just say you gotta learn some, I can't pick a new language anymore, but it used to be a lot easier in the front end world. But now that you have, let's just say there's a new React out there and it's completely different than the stuff today. Then the paired programming or mob programming may not get you there fast. It might be a six month ramp up period. So, there's stuff to think about there, but that would be techniques that you'd say, yep, we're going to do mob programming because we're going to put everybody on the spot and we're going to make sure we're solving these ideas and try to get our work in progress down, our cycle time up and so forth. So these are just kind of high level things that, that I would look for. And I think Jack would look for too. I like to, I like to really emphasize the people thing on that. I think it's super important if you're trying to do this stuff, to get as many, and, and you had mentioned it too, like as many internal partners as you can that are, you know, not just your scrum master buddies or your coaches, like, you know, you need some business partners along the, along the way, somehow or another to say, yes, I, you know, I want to do better too. What are some of those ways, right? Because then, you know, they have their connections. They carry a certain different type of clout than us agilists do, quite frankly, I think, you know, we can be the idea people, but like they can really build that consensus for us and say, we're behind you, Doug, let's do this now. We're going to give you a crack, you know, and see what happens. That's fine. Give us a shot. Let's see what happens. And that's the places where like we have had the hardest time is when we cannot find those partners, right? Or they might be kind of squishy partners. Like, all right, yeah, well, let me think about it and we'll get back to you, right? Like it's strung along a little bit down the road. Um, or it's just as much about building that relationship, right? When you think about putting this stuff together and, and, and kind of showing, here's the thought process, here's why we want to change, here's the things we want to measure. Like, it's a lot easier to get people on board because they start to see it and say, okay, like there's a, there's a thought process. This isn't just a happy-go-lucky type thing, um, which I think Agile for the most part kind of gets a bad rap with some people inside companies because they say there's no process, there's no structure, there's no tools to tell me this kind of stuff. And it, 
it's not true. It's just a lack of understanding. So part of that is, is meeting people where they're at. In some cases, like it takes you no time and you have a lot, you have a strong supporter, mm-hmm. especially in some of the leadership ranks, or sometimes it takes two years to build a relationship. And, and before you know it, like you're at that two year mark and you have a person that's a huge advocate sure. who you didn't expect, right? There's, we've seen that happen yeah. more often than not. So that's, that's just part of it. So you got to think about constantly the message, you know, reiterating here are tools and there's not, there's not like this school bar essentially is the best way to put it, but uh, that's at a high level. Now do it, right? Get people aligned on the message. So, you know, you, you're, you're getting the overhead to, or the go ahead to like, let's go after it, right? So, you know, you're talking about a whole new way of life, right? So there's a ton of messaging that goes into it without even actually starting anything yet. Um, we've had to do that quite a bit, right? Feedback loops. We love that stuff, right? We talk about that a little bit. What's well, working, what's not. You think about it, right? We retro yep. and, and Scrum, especially. Yep. You look at a, a time and point. You talk about the challenges. You talk about things you want to improve. Why is anything that we do at a larger scale any different? I think a lot of people lose track of that. They just say, yep, I have done this. We have set this up and we are effectively on our way. And then a year later, they say something's wrong. Let's talk about it now. And then you get the rush retros, right? Like we're going to retro this. We're going to do postmortem. We're going to do all this stuff. It's too late, right? Like you didn't embrace some of the stuff that, that we do with teams on a, on a you know, bi-weekly, weekly, whatever it is basis. Um, so I think that's important. And I think the other part is realize it isn't going to be perfect. Too many people are scared it's going to fail and that it's going to leave, whether you're rolling out agile for the first time in a company and something doesn't go right, instead of saying, well, why didn't it go right? Let's look at shifting because you think, you know, you think it's going to be something that's given up on. In some cases, I think if, if you're running a little bit scared and, and wanting to be taking the safe bets, essentially. I think that's true even with product owners making those decisions, if you want to like look at it at that level. If you do that, then most likely you won't have the success you really want to achieve here just because you're playing it safe. I'll, I'll, I'll take it back once again to having that, that good partner in, in the company, you know, that, you know, is from the business or I don't know, director, VP, you know, throw any title out there, right? That is with you on this, right? It isn't going to be perfect. It's always going to be, you know, we're finding things that we can make better and we'll do it and we'll make some mistakes along the way. We can be in meetings as a scrum master, or even, you know, Doug's in a lot more meetings than, um, you know, than maybe other corporations have it with, with scrummy people like we. So, you know, we can be in these meetings, talk about things, and then there's all sorts of meetings that work at all these higher levels. And if that message isn't being delivered there too, right, then all of a sudden expectations are changing on us. We don't even know it, right? Um, so that's one of the things, once again, like it goes back to get people aligned on the message. What's one of the messages? Realize everything isn't going to be perfect. Well, and if it isn't going the way you expect, why? Right, like really get down to that messaging on why. Because I think it's very easy for somebody to say, and we've seen like traditional places go, you know, Agile isn't working. Well, why isn't it working? Because I don't know when we could launch this thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, <laughs> what kind of tools can we give you to tell you some, you know, start to paint that narrative or be transparent when we think, you know, something's ready to go? Like, just clearly something's getting lost. It wasn't the fact that it's Agile, it was just the fact of a tool that could be used by a product owner or a team wasn't necessarily being used that way. Or if you're looking at, um, you know, you look at an outcome that you set for yourself. And if your whole goal was to get people to, you know, the example earlier that someone gave us is to, to get people through that process, not just to, to visit for the first time. Well, I think the answer is, well, they're stopping, they're abandoning after a certain point in time. Then the question becomes, well, what are we supposed to do different if we're seeing that early? I think that's the what pivot. Because if we don't know, then we should go figure it out. And I think it's okay to say, 
we don't know, but we need to figure it out. We need to start putting data in place to, to tell us a story to say, okay, we set something that we thought as an indicator, it's not. I think this happens more often if you were in sales to say, I think, you know, I'm gonna sell this product and then I'm gonna get this kind of pairing or something like that. If you, if you looked at it, like, for example, this is kind of lame, but I'll say like for us, snowblower, you're by a snowblower, you're just gonna assume I'm gonna sell that lawnmower to the person too. You may not, <laughs> it may not be a correlation that makes any sense. You may sell the winter gloves, but those are types of things that are very lame in, you know, in real life that you compare it to, but are kind of the reality within some of these businesses. Snowblower is timely. I know. <laughs> For us at least. Yeah. Oh yeah. I wish I wanted to click the wrong button. We're here. Okay. So we get the okay to make a make a big change, right? To get away from some of these things that are bothering us. You know, um, you know, organizational wise. Now, now what do we do? Right. So, you know, this is kind of what we had to do, right? We went from being very siloed as a system to be more like, okay, you know, here's our value stream. Our value stream is, you know, our customer is gonna go on, gonna do this, this, and this. And there are certain pieces along the way that, um, that they go through, like a mood, let's say. You go, you go from the seven moods of value, I just made that up, but like, you know, okay, you're in a happy mood and then you're in a kind of grumpy mood and then hungry mood. So, you know, that all of that uh, figures out into what we call a value stream. So for, for us, we're like, okay, what, how many teams do we have in this value stream? Well, I think we ended up with five or where I'm at. You know, Doug's in a, a lot more value stream talks than I am, but like I'm in five right now, right? So each of these teams now, they're flipping from a, I worked on this system, all, all hail the mighty system to like, what is my value? What value am I giving the customer? Now their system probably has a big play in that, but you know, there's other systems that have a big play in that too. Um, I think it just depends on, on the type again, right? Like what, what are you working on? So if you have a digital presence, you're going to get some of that customer feedback and pain points. And they're going to be, yep. you know, put as hypothesis in the backlog you will solve for as you as you put in outputs. But if you did it, right, and you had just the user stuff, now it's, you know, how do you think about the user if it's the operations team, for example, and you're very focused on supporting them, what do they need, right? I think a lot of times we just give them something that works, but doesn't work great. Like you, you got a load time of 15 minutes for, for them to do their own job, like they're probably not gonna be happy. Um, or five minutes, but it, it's been seen as acceptable with the old system. Now it's not, right? Like now you think about for us to be good at servicing, well, we need to make that experience for, for the operations team as well as um, our customer will eventually see that or whoever we service. But that's just kind of example of get that top of mind. You know, and then it's just a matter of breaking old habits that were there. And that's that can be easy, you know, depending on, depending on the people that are along the journey for you. You know, some people are super excited. Like, yeah, let's go. Let's break everything. And sometimes the message is, we'll slow down a little bit. Like, we'll break that stuff, but let's break it in a couple months. You know, we're breaking some other things right now. Um, Would you call that your own roadmap? Um, change? I guess you could. Like, my roadmap right now with my teams are like, can we break something, please? because they're just not used to that. Like they, it, it goes back to like, change isn't, change isn't easy. For some people it is, for most people it's not, you know? <laughs> it's not always easy for me and I'm a, I'm a scrum master, right? But you, you gotta embrace it. You gotta get a little uncomfortable. You guys all know that stuff. I'm preaching to the choir, but like, like this is a, this, you know, is a struggle um, that I don't know if it always gets called out. I think in our world of agile stuff, it's like, well, everybody wants to change. No, not always the case, right? Um, so it's educating those people. It's, it's helping them. Well, I think it's personalities. Yeah. That, that does play into it. So sometimes you do have people that are like, well, give me the details. And you may not be a detailed <laughs> person. 
Um, <laughs> So I think it's just part of like mm -hmm. understanding that, right? Like sometimes it's not that they don't want to change. You just want to understand how it's different. It's a lot more work and effort put into actually spelling the stuff out, which can seem a little bit like, oh, they're very anti-change, but it's just, they just can't, they can't see it. Yeah. And that, that's been something that I think, you know, some people will dismiss, but it's something you have to look forward to. So this is where we're at right now, right? We have created a value stream where we're at scale. Like it's it's not just one system in their own little silo anymore. It's like, hey, let's get some teams together and let's get them all on the same page to do what we want to do. Um, you know, so we're really right now trying to get all of these teams to you know, share as many things as, as possible. Right to to get them feeling like, hey, you're on your own team, you got your own roadmap, you got your own backlog, but really, you know what what you're doing here is is also kind of similar to what the team next to you is doing as well too. Um, you know, you might be a, a a little early on in the journey, but what you do in in your journey with the work you do is going to affect this guy's journey right next to me here and Samson. Samson, Samson's our made up new person, right? Um, but, you know, so, you know, some of the things that, you know, some of the tactics that we're doing right now for, you know, leveraging, getting this stuff at scale is, you know, we got it right down here, like multiple team ceremonies. So, you know, we're doing something called big room planning, where you, you know, look at a quarter at a time and you get all the teams together and you're not really like, safe planning out releases but you're sharing all the work that you're doing every team is sharing all the work that they're doing with each other um, you're plotting it out a little bit you're you're making an initial plan that you know is going to change but then you're also sharing that with your stakeholders um, so you know calling out dependencies with other teams my team is doing this doug i'm going to need you to do some work in february does that work okay with you doug gives me an answer we talk it out Right, we figure something out. Well, it's not rigid either. Exactly. So the goal, right, when you look at these things is, is how do you still allow for flexibility? Nobody's coming in and saying, here's the set points between each other. They're kind of understanding, you know, th the main thing here, I think that, that people really want to focus in on is when you look at any quarterly exercise, whether you're trying to plan a release together, yep. and stuff like that, it's less about, yeah, the dependencies are big, but it's about what are teams doing? So we have a shared purpose. So if you think about the thing that we talked about initially, it's looking at teams lose track of why they do the things that they do. And this is intent to say, okay, now you know why we're doing this thing holistically across this selection of teams. Like we have a purpose, we know what the priorities are. We know like, you know, things that we used to pretend like we didn't think the other team couldn't pick up you know, now can be addressed. So there's, there's some honest conversations that happen up front, but yet, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing that Jack's getting back to is like, you have to, you have to just try something and then see how it works and then go from there. If it's not working, then do something different. Right. And, and a lot of that, that quarterly planning stuff, it's, it's good transparency for our stakeholders as well too. Um, it answers questions about why things can be done when they can be done and then you know it's behooves us to follow up when things change right we do um we do a sprint review that's five teams together um that's nice they all share wins they all see what's going on plus i think really i think the biggest one it gets back to these you know these, once again these big corporations you have all these stakeholders you know at, at some level or another right and you, you want them at all your ceremonies, but everybody's on their own schedule for the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're a VP in technology and you got 10 different teams wanting you to go to their sprint reviews. Oh, you also got your day job. Um, that's hard. So what we did is we're like, hey, you know, we're gonna have one sprint review for, you know, five teams, maybe six or seven. Some people wanna join us. And, Feels like a big team, feels like a big party sometimes, you know, depending on who you ask. I think it's a big party. But like, you know, all those stakeholders can go there now. 
Like we're getting tons of stakeholders at these meetings. They're asking questions. You know, we send out an agenda ahead of the time saying, hey, from you know, the first dog walk, we're gonna have these people come here and talk about this. So if you're interested in these teams and what they did, join at, you know, for the first 20 minutes. The next 20 minutes, we're gonna talk about this and so forth. So there's a there's a lot of a lot of different things to do with this at scale ceremony stuff, but they're pretty neat. So far, so good, anyways. You know, and the, the sell on this was, hey, we're gonna do something called a value stream sprint review and we'll see how it works, right? It might um, be a little sketchy at first, like our first couple podcasts. You never mm -hmm. wanna to listen to those things again, but you know, we'll figure it out and we make it better. And it seems like each sprint review has gotten better. Now. So something cool there, digging it. Right. So then go for it. Well, I think the, the biggest part that kind of Jack's talking about is you, you think about the things that we're talking about, like how do you learn these new techniques or how do you learn some of the stuff and especially apply it? I think it's, you know, how do you create that learning model baked in? So what are good metrics to measure? Like you, you really have to experiment with it and say, you know, is it a trap? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, it really in the end right if they're not good then don't use them like get something else in there but i think also looking at figure out if the skills are working you know are those skills that we thought we needed are we focusing on it are we getting the right right feedback you know in place for for what we're doing or are we not so the other part of it really if you're thinking about learning right did you go into these big quarterly sessions or say you're just talking to people you're just setting up forums where you have that conversation are you actually eliminating dependencies if you're not or if you're constantly maybe not eliminates a little strong word but at least lessening yeah is that is that even a word lessening <laughs> lessen dependencies minimize well ideally right like it you you better understand where you know you're having to rely on and, and you're having those conversations if you're having a lot of surprises still something's really broken there so you know, what are you learning from there? Is it the communication? Is the product owners not talking to each other? Is the business getting just ever-changing things that are happening in the environment that you need to respond to? There's something there. So it's like dig into it, try something different and go from there. I think, you know, when you look at the roles or when, when you look back at, at like, do we have the people? And sometimes you set up different types of skill sets in there. And you might say like, we need really technical people in our PO area and it's not working what can we learn if we start to put some scale roles in there is it what we expect or do we not need it or was it too much overhead that kind of stuff so with that like if you learn from it just just change it ideally yeah. right yeah right and that comes down to that personality thing too like it comes down to personality thing it comes down to messaging it comes down to getting a good partner right and just finding you know you know finding your that person that can, you know, understands exactly what you're going after too, right? Which is experiment, find ways to do better, right? fix it up a little bit and see what works, figure out what isn't and fix it. Question time. I got it, we we're done. I know, question time. <laughs> let's get out of here, let's go back to, let's go back to videos. What metrics have you seen change since you've done this? Are you looking more from a team level or a customer? Both. What are you tracking? Yeah, I think one of the things that we're tracking, at least focus wise, is like, what does it take for a customer lead time? So you think about an idea. So like you come up with an idea, how long does it actually take for a customer to see it? Those, those are things that that I think are near and dear, especially delivery. So think about things like Agile with DevOps, for example, the two kind of philosophies coming together. So like for our instance, we're looking at making an increase, you know, where you see like a 10% or something where it means they're, they're deploying more, they're, they're breaking things, they're trying to put it out there faster, um, but it still takes some time. I think that's the hardest one to change because you have so much red tape within organizations to, to whether it's compliance, whether it's release old processes, the test data, think about all the things that you come into um, and have to actually have a conversation around. That's that's one. Uh, customer data, I think this one is 
has been interesting. I think it's, I think we've seen a few ideas broken <laughs> just in terms of, you know, we, we thought like in some cases generating more leads potentially in a space would mean more business. Not really the case kind of thing. Like, yeah, you got me there, but I don't know if I like this. So the experience isn't great. So I'm going to drop out this midpoint. So that was something that, that we saw as a real, real world example as a, as a change. So I, I think just getting some of that also just kind of a maturity of going from hits and traffic. So that, that's kind of the cons like when we've seen that in the digital space of, you know, we get a lot of visits per day, but that's just because they're logging in. And in some cases they're not really doing anything. So it doesn't really lead to anything other than they're, they're engaged. So those are probably the, the couple of things that we're most focused on. Hi, I had a question. I believe in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned about, um, you know, for certain roles or certain people within the organization may not see that things aren't working. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any recommendations as far as, you know, and say if they call it reaching the tipping point or for those who may think that things are going kind of fine as is, um, any recommendations of, you know, how to shed light on potentially leading them to better ways of working? It's a tough nut to crack. There's no doubt about it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my approach, and I'm not going to say it always works because it doesn't, right? But, you know, generally when, when we're in a spot like there's, you know, Agile's already been presented to the company. Now, the maturity of it is completely, who knows where it is, but you know, when you're dealing with that, you know, person that, well, you know, hey, things are going okay. So like, what's Agile going to give me or something like that? You know, it's, I, I try to say, look, this is the way we're going. This is the benefits we're going to give you, whatever, whatever that is, right? More transparency, faster to market, you know, better customer focus, you know, whatever, what, whatever, like Doug was saying, whatever you want to look at, like, then the message to my message is just like, just come with me for a little bit. Let's see where we can get this. We'll be able to get it somewhere. And if we're not getting it to where we think, then we'll change up. We'll make it better. Like we have these feedback loops in place. It's the sprint review. It's sprinting. It's talking to people. Um, try, to, try to bring them along on that path to be like, we're not writing this stuff in concrete you know, we expect it to only get better. Well, I think it, it gets back to, right, like you, you look at the narrative that they're telling, which is, you know, they may not be on board. They say things are working. Things but are the, working. But the question is, how do we know it can't work better? So, you know, that's the one thing, like if we squash the ideas before they happen, then we really never find out if we could be a better version of where we're at today. So I think that's really the question you got to get them into is, is get them to think it a little bit differently and say, Maybe that's true, right? Like, why can't we just try with something small? Like, let's just pick a little pilot here. Or let's just do something <laughs> different and then say, okay, we're going to learn from it. But you set the expectation, like Jack said, which is just because we try it. And this is where I think people get trapped is they try something and then if it doesn't work, then it, it's deemed a failure. So then they want to stop it or you want to stop it. And that's not the answer. Is like, we should take that and then say, okay, where, where could we have learned from it? What did we learn from this? What do we... What are we seeing like of it? It's the same retro concept, but you got to keep that conversation going because once it stops, it's not good. I think so that makes sense. Oh, just to say that answer your question. <laughs> not the greatest <laughs> answers. I mean, no, it's all good. And something else I've you know tried too is as far as like bringing up or bubbling up information, and then like to your point of proving a hypothesis of you know here's some things that I'm seeing based upon data or what have you. And then um, if we try this approach, this is where it should lead us. So I, yeah, I think uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Hopefully you have like, you know, one of their peers, um, you know, you're on board with and, and, and you have good partnership with, and then, you know, you can work on, you know, one side and then, you know, your peer can be like, hey, give, you know, give Doug a crack. I, I think he's got some good stuff, you know, and oh, okay, well, you know, that's where that value of that partnership comes in. Or sometimes when you're ready to give up on it, they, they end up <laughs> in the corner. 
I've honestly seen that more often than not. Like people I thought would never change do change. And it just takes like, you know, whether it's seven times or 70 times that it, it's just finally to understand what you're trying to say. 70 times. That's true. There, <laughs> there was a thing. Did I used to tell you like somebody, like sometimes I felt like I had to say something 70 times and I was like, I can't believe I have to keep telling you this over and over and over again. And then they finally got it. So there's, there's parts of that. So it's like being stubborn sometimes does play to your advantage. Hello, I have a question um, kind of in general, because uh, you've given a really interesting playbook on how we can do this in our own organizations. Uh, I'm curious to hear uh, your experiences with um, changing an organization from the inside, kind of starting with, it sounds like you started with one team and grew it beyond to encompass multiple teams. I'm not sure, I, I'm curious if you um, had executive buy-in and were able to kind of implement this across the company, or if you had to build this slowly within certain senior leaders organizations first, um, but I'd love to hear kind of your personal experience and, and how it went and kind of like, I don't know, obviously I'm sure that's like a long story, but I'd love to get some highlights of um, your experience with, um, did you find yourself implementing this like one team at a time? Were you given like several teams at once under one senior leader, that kind of thing? I'd love to hear kind of like um, All the that best. story. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer first and then I'll let Doug finish. Uh, yes. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's a good question. I mean, it's all of the above. So I think we've been in each scenario, whether it's been ground up and you've had to convince people to do it. I think that's more of you. Know, I've had it mandated at least one time where you had to figure it out and that was kind of a cluster. But the, the thing that it, de it depends on where the buy-in, I think sometimes they'll get executive buy-in and they'll say, hey, make it happen and we'll give you the money. And so it's up to whoever's in those positions or whoever is getting the kind of the first ring to spend to say, what's that philosophy? Are we going to spend a lot on coaching? Or are we going to try to get a lot of people out to just saying that trying phase of it and saying, let's set up. And I think the, the one that I'm probably the most proponent or at least the biggest proponent of is, is just getting a lot more teams set up to get into that thinking. Because in order to change a company's mindset, it's by volume. So when you focus on the one individual team, what happens, and, and we've been in this, we get a really, really, really good team and they're almost impossible to replicate because it sets an unfair advantage for them because they had all this energy and effort and focus and everyone cleared the way for them. So the next team comes up and they're like, well, why isn't it as you know, efficient? Now you can overcome it, don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, that's kind of stuff that we've seen when the executives really push on it or, <laughs> In some cases, we see them bring in what just the we call them the fleet of coaches. Yep. Where just you you'd say, okay, well, you know, bring in fifty people, and then they're they're gone because it's very expensive if you think about doing it that way. Um, so the short term answer for you, like, I, I kind of told you my preference to put all those teams in kind of the same category, knowing that's not super realistic across the whole organization. But let's just say, if you get five teams started at once or ten, that's probably the best because then you got, a, you know, a group there that can, can kind of grow together and then learn things and collaborate and get stronger. Um, that, that would be. You're building up your credit, you're building up the trust, right? And you're doing it, you're still doing it small because we're talking corporations, right? So it's not just this one team that's a snowflake. It might be five like <laughs> unsnowflakeish teams, but you know, they're all doing things, maybe a scooch differently, but at the same time, it's like, there's something there. And it's, and it's like, look, these five teams, you're building up credit. People are talking now. There's, there's word on the street that I, I want to be like one of those five teams. And, you know, that's what I've seen Doug do. And then, you know, after a while, it's like, people are coming to him and say, Hey, can you make my team agile? Like what a flip, what a flip is that? Like how many times have, have we been in, you know, a corporation and we are just trying to get a foothold, you know, we're trying to make things better. And 
once you get that trust going, then people are like, hey, can, can I be agile, Doug? Yeah. Or changing, you want to change the job descriptions, that kind of stuff. It's very hard to do with just one team. But now you got, you know, you're saying, okay, maybe I have 10 individuals or whatever. Now, if you have five and you have 50, right? You have 10, you have 100, you're just ballparking it. For you to change titles, it's a lot easier when you go to HR and all that stuff to have those conversations because now you're you're a bigger impact to them. Now, if you're a Fortune 100, 100 people isn't very big. So granted, you know, you still have some weight to put there. So that's, that's what I'd say. I, I would say overall, the toughest ones to change, depending on where it's at, like some of the, the middle leadership, depending if they understand it, they've been in a certain environment for a long time, even with the executive pushing, you know, an agenda to your kind of earlier point, you still run into some of those things where the leaders aren't that comfortable. And they're like, even though I know my boss is telling me over here that I need to do these things, I know that, you know, long tenure of my career, potentially it, these things have gone away. So I'm going to try to wait it out or I'm just not going to look like and somebody that's openly, you know, against this. So there's, there's some challenges either way to overcome, if that helps. Does it help at least give you some perspective? Yeah, I think so. Um... Yeah, it's it's definitely a question of. Uh, it sounds like it's gone multiple ways. Yeah, you you but. can basically I think the the moral of the story is you can start anywhere and end anywhere you want, even with no executive buy-in. Like I've seen companies that have had success and then executives get curious and start talking to other ones and you know think about CEOs. They happen to go to a different forum and they go, hey, is your, are your teams doing Agile or is this something like, what's this about? And they're like, yeah, this is what we're doing. And all of a sudden they start hearing some positive things and you get the buy-in, you know, on the back half. So there's just things to look at differently. That's all. All right. Thank you. may have covered this, but can I ask to go back to the early, early beginning? I think a lot of um, people on the bottom level where a lot of the intelligence is oftentimes have hypotheses on what they think the problem is. How it, let's say you think you have the brilliant idea, like you know what the problem is. How do you know that's the real root cause? How do you start um, getting buy-in and generating excitement and deciding that this is the change to try to put all your energy behind? Um, I think it's like a personal tipping point. How do you know it's worth putting the effort to try to be like the shepherd of this change? I got, I'm still, you know, thinking about multiple answers. If you got something, shoot. Yeah. I think it, I think it really just depends on, on how fed up you are with the scenario, but you know, if you put it in, into perspective and you break it down, like the people that you're dealing with don't know the details. So every pain point that you see day in, day out, they see a tenth of it and they hear about a tenth of it and they don't really see it right like in their mind you know people seem happy enough they seem like this is okay like you know i might get up push back here and there but you know and oftentimes not everybody tells especially you think about leadership that they're dealing with what's actually going on it, it definitely gets filtered so it just depends on do you feel like you have that relationship to start to bring up these ideas and say well what do you think and sometimes you'll get people that are like i'm never even doing that Right? Like there's a lot of executives we talked to that had no clue what was going on because like some of the news was new to them, but it's gotten filtered and you know, for them to actually want to change it, they had to know about it. So I think if you're frustrated enough, you feel like you have, you know, that relationship to start reaching out. I think it's, it's build the relationship first before dropping it on them and then, and then probably push forward because what I think we've seen as a challenge because we've seen individuals do, like whether it's in engineering or you know UX or somewhere else, they, they get frustrated. They have a breaking point. They say, I know what the problem is here, but it, it's built up for so long and they haven't actually had the storytelling behind it and built a relationship with the people that, that can help here. So then it just kind of sounds like a complaint. So that's where, you know, if you, you start setting, like it was a lot easier in the office, but like even now, like they're more accessible to say, will you virtually spend whatever time with me and maybe we can discuss this and how open are you to this? That's where I would start. And then maybe, you know, you start putting in stuff like, well, what do you think you like is broken here and start to get their opinion. Those, those would be the steps that I would follow if I was in those shoes. 
I'm, I'm very similar to that. I think it's like we're trying to trying to get buy-in from somebody at, at the lower levels, be it because they just, they're happy, or maybe they're so burned out that it's like, oh, here we go. Here's another flavor of the month, right? Um, I'll, I'll try to, you know, find, just find one thing. Think of it almost like a retro thing. Like what's, what's your pain point? What's your one pain point? Or let's try to get a win. You know, here's a win gang. Let's, you get to pick what you want in the sprint. Oh, how can that be? I was like, well, try it. Let's see what happens. Then you do it. And then you're done with sprint planning. And they're like, oh, you mean this is what we're going to do? Yeah, this is what you get to do, you know, and just find that one win. And then you just build on it. All right, great. You know, now what else? What else is bothering you? I, I don't like these acceptance criteria don't make sense. Oh, what do you mean by that? You know, or, ah, you know, you, you know, there's nothing in these stories. Let's put some stuff in the stories. What do you want to put in the story? Well, I think we should do this. All right, let's do it then. What? You're letting me do that? Yeah, I get to do it. Let's try it. Right? And all of a sudden there's another win kind of building up a little wins. That's, yeah. sometimes it works, you know, sometimes it doesn't. I've, I've seen them both. I think the business or leadership is the same example, right? Like they're just people at the end of the day. And so a lot of them, you know, sometimes I think we're, we, we think they know more than they do and, and you don't. So it's kind of a humbling experience when you, when you hear like how, you know, they interpret something completely different than, than you would have ever expected. Or you think about I mean, just imagine like if you've been in these situations where you get to a point of release and you have your main like business group that's supporting these customers come and they're like, this isn't at all what I thought you're going to build. It's like, well, how does that happen? Right? Like, but that's kind of the same concept of they don't see the problem that's there today. Like, what do you mean there's a problem? What do you mean there's something I can try differently? So that's, that's probably a way to just think about it. You guys are having a mouse problem earlier. It looks like Catherine has a cat for you guys now. <laughs> a cat earbud problem. Cat walks. We could have used the cat with the mouse problem. <laughs> so, hey, Sherry, are we ready for our giveaway? I am. Well, is everybody else ready? Yeah. So what um, Jack and Doug have so generously offered, for those that stayed till the end, and Isla, I see you there listed twice. You don't get a vote twice. <laughs> but... Too bad, but um, but I'm gonna share my screen and I just want you guys um, to let me know if you happen to see, um, can you see the wheel picker? Hold on, let me share. Not yet. Nope, not yet. Getting there, there we go. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, Is your, let me know if your name is not there and I will add it. I, I think I've been pretty good about keeping tabs on it. Speak up now. So um, Jack and Doug, do you just want to um, explain like what you're offering up? Um, you know, how much time, how much of your time are you offering up and, and what do these, the, the, what does the winner get, get of your time? <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll start, I'll, I'll keep it kind of high level. Like the winner gets an hour of our time for, whatever it is you, you, you want to talk about, you know, maybe, we'd, maybe we delve a little bit more into the specifics of, you know, some of our trials and tribulations. Maybe you want to talk podcasting. Maybe you want to start an agile podcast or I don't know, it doesn't matter. Like a how to write books podcast. It doesn't matter. Like if we got some podcasting experience, not the greatest thing in the world, but I thought, thought we did. Okay. Maybe you want to talk about that or want us to talk you through to that. I don't know. Maybe that website. would be of interest. Website. website. Oh, got our website. We would help you with website. It, I wish we had another crack at the website. Creative content. Yeah, we need to better it out. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about our content. No, for, I think like if you have your own, you know, growth areas or you're struggling with challenges that you don't have you know, expertise on, you know, we, we've had a lot of different background knowledge from companies that have done things differently, what's worked, what's not. There's a lot of things that have. So whatever you really want to talk about, we're, we're open. Wonderful. Well, um, for wh whomever might be the uh, winner, we, what I'll do is I'll ask you to please um, make sure the Google sheet, the sign-in sheet is up to date with your information and we'll email you 
um, contact information to get you guys connected. Uh, by, by the way, um, Jack and Doug are not in our time zone. So that's another thing to kind of consider as well. So I'm going to go ahead and spin. Richard, I did add you. We've got a Rich and we've got a Richard. So I'm going to go ahead and spin. Greg, Greg. Greg. Congrats, Greg. Are you here, Greg? If you're not here, we're we'll spin again. Speak up, or, or hold your peace. Can you can you scroll through and see if he's indeed here? I don't think he is. Uh, I don't think so. If anyone sees him in the do, no, I think he's gonna spin okay. again. Ooh, what does he, he can... even know what he missed out on? Good. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> poor guy. Oh. It's not tell him. The room is not. Jaya. Hello. Hello. Hey, Jaya. Sorry, how are you? <laughs> Good. Well, it looks like you're the winner. So you you get um, to have a little bit of time with these gentlemen to discuss whatever you would like to discuss. Uh, logistics you. question. Jaya, can you please put your contact information in the sign-in sheet if it's... Yeah, I'm just doing that. Okay. As, as Awesome. So we can yep. connect you via email so that you can coordinate um, how you want to schedule. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And when, when we do that, then you can come over to my house again and we'll do this. We don't get to see each other too much anymore with, you know, COVID and all that other stuff going on and working from home. So we're glad to give you, thank you so much for contributing to our community. And we're glad to give you an excuse to go see each other in person. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We appreciate it. We're in the opposite sides of the city, even though like no traffic, it's still yeah, you gotta put effort in, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for driving, Doug. Doug actually got in a car and overcame his fear of driving and came here. Yep. Oh, congrats. So if folks would like to learn more about you, where can they hear maybe some of those really cool uh older podcast episodes or um where else do you have content or are you open to emails? I I would stay away from our website, Scrum Under Siege, because when we awesome. <laughs> when we stop podcasting, like you know, we, we also didn't want to continue to, to pay for storage and all that other stuff. So we had to make some decisions. So I think the podcast that we have remaining, the best bet is, you know, find them on your podcast, you know, Apple podcast or whatever. I used to know all those podcast things. I don't anymore. Um, You're all major ones. All, all major ones. That sounds like at the end of our podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Find us on all major podcasts. Do Scrum Under Siege. I think we got about 15 podcasts out there. Um, I think at one time we had 40, we got 15 left. Those are the ones that had the most views, most hits. Um, probably the coolest ones out there besides metrics, it's a trap. Um, we, we interviewed like a coach, we interviewed a tech lead, we interviewed, um, yeah, yeah. a couple of coaches. Yeah. So those are good ones. <laughs> we actually got to interview people. It was, you guys turned the table on us today. It was very odd. Um, we had to yeah. come up with the questions. Mm -hmm. Jack, Jack struggled with it. So there are some, you can tell which one he's struggling with more. I'm just kidding. No, there's, there's parts of it. So yeah, I think check that out. You can always go to actually scrum under siege.com as well, which gives you links, even though Jack is anti referring, I guess. I'm just setting realistic expectations and being transparent. Awesome. Well, I know folks have to drop. We try to keep our well within our 90 minute time box thank you so much for joining us thank you everyone who you know spent 90 minutes with us on a school night on a work night hope you'll join us later us. thank you everyone bye bye thank you